Now, subsidy and remote value, subsidy itself is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to invest in the petroleum sector. Yeah. In, absolutely impossible. Because why would anybody want to build refinery when when petrol is being sold below the price in the country? Yeah. That's what that's what this is what a number of people didn't understand or still don't understand. What drives the price of petrol in Nigeria is international price of oil. Those components, the other components about transport, shipping, blood, blood storage, they're actually small elements. The big element is how much it costs in the international market, how much the price of crude in the international market. So the more the higher this thing goes up, the more expensive it becomes. Now, people have made the argument, oh, we are an oil producing country. We should be getting benefits. The problem is, I don't think Nigeria should actually be called an oil producing country. Because if you compare the numbers with yeah. other countries, Nigeria is 210 million. We are producing at about the same level as Libya. We are actually slightly lower than Libya. Libya, I don't think they have over 10 million people in Libya. And people, no, no. Yeah. And people expect the per capita income on crude oil to be as high to as To be the same, possible. yeah. Not possible. Be to, just tell my, tell my, or tell, tell them your, your journey through life, uh, your, your career a little bit, and what you have been doing till now. Yes, been doing a, a couple of things. So after we left uh, secondary, we went to the university, you and I, same school, same hostels at times. Yeah, we, we went to the same class, class, <laughs> chemistry, <laughs> and all, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So after that, um, I did my youth service in the north, mm. Zamfara, the same Zamfara that uh, bandits are over all now. You, you know, you know, we have we have I have audience outside Nigeria. So when you say oh, okay. the north, tell them yeah. north of, of, of where the north, the north of Nigeria. Good, good, Nigeria. good. You know, so where I did my youth service, very lovely place then. Mm. Uh, fortunately, there's been some troubles with bandits. Mm. Place of recent. So the kind of news coming out from there of late have not been fantastic. So after that, I got a I started a marketing career with Procter & Gamble. Mm. Uh, became a brand manager. Yeah. And went to, into telecoms in 2001, you know. And I did that about the time the whole telecom thing was picking steam, you know, MTN yeah. came country very exciting time then oh yeah know. oh yeah the forum Two, 2001 i think yeah 2001 yes yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. plenty of fun learning new things it was like a, a new portal it was just yeah with, yeah with I, I i remember i remember you, you invited us to some of the events you guys yes, did yes, yes. Well, how is that really then? yeah <laughs> and i worked on some of the more glamorous part of the business so i was yeah. i was doing advertising yeah yeah advertising and my interface with so many different teams across you know so many projects so i learned a lot and um and i actually opened my eyes to how technology can be used to change the world make, you know make life better for nigerians yeah and i, I think we're not really doing enough overall anyway it was still in the same telecoms that I still MTN that I entered the fintech world. So I ran Mover Money for MTN and then went on to run Mover Money for Globalcom. And when I finished there, I um, my time in telecoms when it was over, I uh, joined a startup called MFS Africa. Now MFS Africa has grown into a relatively big and successful company now, mm. uh, present in 40 countries in Africa. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Doing well, actually. So it was uh, it was a good thing. It was it also, a lot of exciting things were also done in the company. And they're still doing plenty of interesting stuff, you know, because let's face it, it's the whole of the continent is still... It's, it's a virgin land. Yeah. Relatively virgin in many areas. So... 
I'm always excited to see teams like that, you know, going in to open up such spaces. So from there, I started um, 3DBC. 3DBC had actually been started, 3 Communication yeah. for MFS. So, but the two are kind of running side by side. Uh, 3DBC was into other services and a couple of other services. So 3DBC veered into, you know, um, de de deploying networks. Yeah. By services and all that are related services. So lately, I've been focusing more on a venture with some friends. We call it FinTechGrade. It's uh, also a FinTech, you know, and uh, we're hoping to change, or let me say improve the payment landscape across the whole of the continent. Yeah. Um, so that's what has been keeping me busy. Yeah, yeah. Great, great communications. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. You are doing great things. You are doing great things. So, uh, when I, when I called you, was it last week or two weeks yes. ago? You were in in the north on that yeah. in the car. Huh? Yes, so, yes, yes. My familiar so, terrain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, t t t tell us what, what were you doing? What were you uh, looking okay. for? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I know you be you you businessman. You are always looking for something. Uh, yeah, you know you remember having saying that you see a good man running. If uh, he's not being pursued by something, something he's pursued something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the case here. Yeah. Mm. So um, you know, one of the things we do at Three Way Communications is uh, using technology to deliver a number of services. Education is one of them. Okay. So. We implemented this service at the Kitty State University where we deployed education services on pervasive Wi-Fi across the campus. Okay, and that's, so, that's good. Yes, so we were, we were looking at, uh, we actually been trying to replicate it across a couple of uh, other schools in Nigeria and we made some strides, you know, so that's actually what took me to the Northwest, KB State to be precise. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we met with um, a few schools and sold a proposition to them, you know, how our service can help them digitize education, deliver better quality education, and so on and so forth. You know, we have a suite of services. I don't want to, I don't want us to get into it, so I just want to mm, bore you Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but for me, the critical thing here is, um, you know, being able to use technology to advance a number of things, including education. Yeah. You know, and the, the, if the opportunity is actually limitless because yeah. there are so many sectors in this country that technology digitization will help. So, and I don't think we as a people are doing enough in that regard. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. See, now, I know we in Nigeria, uh, most of our, most, the biggest educational in institutions in our, in our country are government owned and run. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what is the policy of the, of the, Educational ministry in Nigeria, in terms of doing that, what what you guys are trying to? Yeah, we we actually had a couple of discussions mm -hmm. with a few people, you know, in government, in the last government, you know, before this one, we yeah. met with some people, some agencies, and we looked at where our service can add value, you know, and the how to make it happen. Um, it was not so straightforward in the sense that <laughs> yeah. there was not a lot of money. You know, our service costs money. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, you, you need to get the buy-in of a number of groups mm. to make it happen. So, and, you know, the primary people we want to deliver service to are the students. But like yeah. you said, these big institutions are owned by the government. And when we even say the government, we are talking several layers of agencies. Mm. So 
convincing them that this is high priority is a lot of work. Wow. It's not that they don't see the value in it, they see the value. But there are a couple of others. The first one is, is this what we should be doing now? Is it the most pressing thing on their table? Mm. The second one is, how much is it going to cost? You know? Yeah. So, uh, and of course, when you have so many decision points like that, arriving at a decision so quickly isn't so... It's, not, it's, it's going to be difficult, yeah. It's actually quite uh, difficult. You know? wow. So that's why I would say you know, it appears as if the education institution uh, agencies in the country are not yeah. going to think about it to the level that we want on the surface but i know they are because like i said we they've engaged a few and they, they love the idea they love it they will want to have it all across yeah it's not it's a process it's a lengthy process mm. well see i'm passionate you know about education Mm -hmm. In fact, more more about education after schooling, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. See, that's 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 what has kept me mm -hmm. going for the last mm -hmm. uh, ten years. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I was talking to someone. Yeah, this no, yesterday it was. See, information is everywhere. Was it you? Or somewhere I was what? talking. See, I talked to a lot of people, so I I, I don't even remember who yeah. it was I was talk, talking to. Mm -hmm. See, information is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And it seems it's further away from the people who should get it because because everybody wants to know everything, and yeah. we th we tend to we, t we tend to burden our brain with so much information that we don't focus on anything. Yes. Okay. You know, it's, there's a, how do I put it? There's a bit of, oh, let me say, some people have actually done research to understand how people process information. Yeah. Generally. And I think the, some of the reasons they gave was, it was biological, you know, it was something we inherited from yeah. our ancestors because you know there are so many things to work in the ancient in ancient times yeah when even to, to today were not so developed you know it was like a carryover from those days people had so many things to worry about they are running away from tiger lion this thing that will kill you and all that the last thing you want is to dwell too much on something not important on something that appears not important. You don't want to overanalyze. Mm. So you basically just follow what the others before you, yeah. before you did, right? So that's why it appears as if, oh, there's a lot of information on, you know, we don't know. So so when, when people act, they tend to act based on things that are laid down that have been tested. Try that test. Ah, it, it makes it. It so makes fact, sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Is a, is a safer thing to do, you know? So, yeah, there's a bit of biology in it. Mm. Well, yeah. See, now we have a, we, we spent so much time, Nigerians in particular, in, in, talking about uh, the presidential election. Mm -hmm. Now it has come and gone. Mm -hmm. The court rulings have come and gone. Okay. So, what what are your views about uh, the outcome of the election and the challenge in court and the court ruling in general? For me, I think it's um, what I what the whole thing for me offers some optimism. Okay, yeah. I mean, compared with what we used to have in the past, right? I'm not, I know there were a couple of discrepancies here and there, but I think the final result actually reflects the will of the people. Mm. You, know, you understand Nigeria geopolitics. You know that a lot of a lot of calculation, you know, dealing and willing and all of those negotiations <laughs> go into you know uh, yeah. winning elections in Nigeria. And um 
those that designed our electoral process, I think there's actually a lot of wisdom in some of the things they did. Number one, this thing about the third majority. Yeah. And the spread. You can't win election if you don't have a spread across the country. Even if you have majority, you, you get. Yeah. So what that does is it saves the country from a single ethnic group, you know, using this number to just continuously win election. Mm. You really have to, you have to build bridges across a number of groups in the country to win elections. Yeah. You know, so while that safeguards certain things, it also complicates the whole process. <laughs> So in the past, what we had was, uh, we had a number of electoral fraud, ballot stuffing is a very critical one, right? Yeah. Uh, but then they introduced IREV, which I think changed a whole lot of things. I mean, I was there on election day and you can tell that some of the uh, fraud techniques that they were using in the past were no longer applicable. Okay. But of course, some of these guys still got very creative. <laughs> <laughs> so they tried to find a way around it. But it didn't, it didn't work so well like it used to work in the past. So mm. you can almost say that electoral fraud from uh, ballot stuffing, for example, yeah. is eliminated as long as we keep this system. Of course, the system needs to be improved. Right? Okay. It's, we need to put in a lot of improvements in the system. But I'm happy that at least ballot stuffing is out of the question. Right now, what they're trying now trying to do is oh, they're transmitting results from the polling booth to the server at the back end. They're trying to see how that can be manipulated. But even that is now difficult because now the tribunals are actually quite firm in in how they how they go about resolving uh, electoral cases, as we have okay. seen. So if you don't get these things right, if you don't have the right evidence and and uh, all of those things to defend your case you know, your case gets thrown out. Hmm. So um, I think I think we are making a lot of improvements, in my opinion. I think we are making improvements. We are not where we should be. Uh, free and fair elections and, uh, you know, producing leaders that are the true representatives of the people is really the key to transforming the country. Yeah. Right? But I think we are, we are, on, the, we are on that path. Wow. That path. Well for 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 me for me uh irrespective of the the who wins or didn't win any particular election mm -hmm. uh the process is important and awesome. and for me we should not cancel the process just yes. because something went wrong Yes, in a particular election. Yes, but what what I want to see is an improvement. Yes, uh, discussion about the difficulties. Yes, and then solving these problems, yes. implementing a solution, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, very critically for me, we need to make all the rules as clear as possible absolutely okay absolutely. so yeah. uh i i hope the next election will be, will be better okay absolutely so, more awareness. and you know i i think one of the one of our weakness as a people is we expect others to do things for us you know so mm -hmm. when people complain oh they have uh, done this they have done that question is what are we, the, the people who don't want those negative things being done? What are we doing? Doing, yeah. Together, as a people, to fight for what is right. I, I yeah. don't think we are doing enough of that. You know, in the last election, there was a lot of voter intimidation. Now they can't stop ballot voters. So the other technique is stop stopping okay. from even voting. <laughs> so, oh my God. Uh, you know, what are we going to do about it? Mm. You know, so I think those are some of the things we should be having discussions around, right? So what's the solution? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what, what solution can be applied there. 
aside from creating that awareness and about the negative of this thing. Yeah. So I don't think we are doing enough. See, many... the, the, the problem with all those people intimidating potential, potential voters is mm -hmm. this. When you intimidate people to stop them from voting, mm -hmm. okay, maybe your candidate wins, but in the long run, yes. your children, your cousins, yes. your brothers, yes. are, they going to, are they going to get what they want in the next dispens dispensation? Yes. Maybe yeah, you course. maybe you are you have, you have been paid, but even the money they paid you, is it is this enough for you mm -hmm. to survive through the the next few years until a new election comes? And that's the education that needs to be, or let me say the, the education process that Nigerians need to go through. Yeah. Now look, you may get paid for doing this but see this is the larger cost of this action to you you know because part of the reason why people engage in these things they don't see the full cost yeah right they yeah. actually believe that it's not costing them anything that is all profit yes in reality the cost is huge huge yeah you know they don't see the direct cost to them if they if, they, if you're able to make them see the direct cost a lot of people will behave differently you know, so that's the education that needs to be done. You know, how that can be done? Uh, it, it, it can be done first, first, if if at least everybody in the country has adequate 12 years of schooling. If everyone, at least a majority of our population mm -hmm. have 12 years of schooling. Exactly. We can read, mm -hmm. we can analyze, we mm -hmm. can debate. Absolutely. Ba basic things. So yes. that whenever the smart people write, yeah, yeah. and in, in, with big grammar in mm -hmm. newspapers, all of us can read it and yes. can understand. Yes. And we can even ask more questions. Mm -hmm. okay? That's, see, for me, before we we can improve our democracy, yes. we need to improve our education level in the country. Absolutely, it's very important. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. One because, of the, yeah, one knowledge of the democracy. Yes, is you know low human capital development, which mm. is. Which correlates strongly with education. The lower the yeah. education level, the higher the chances that some unscrupulous elements will like jack the majority yeah. of education. Because if, if everybody uh, at least have, yeah. have basic education, when mm -hmm. they come and tell you, come and take on one bag of beans or rice yeah. and vote, you will tell them, get tell them out. This, is, this is worth nothing. Yeah. Yes. But because yeah. the majority are poorly educated or Especially in this area, they don't they don't see the full costs or the consequences of this. They play along, you know. So education is actually quite key, very very key, very very important. Education is a, is is everything. Yes, everything. No, yeah. no. So I don't think we emphasize the importance of education enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, I've always said, oh, education can come in different forms, you know, at a different level. You know, in growing up, for me, I think one thing that appears to be lacking in Nigeria's education system is this thing about critical thinking, mm. right? I can't really put a clear definition on it because it appears a little above force. But I think by the time is an individual finishes primary or secondary school in Nigeria, he should be able to tell his life his left from his right. Yeah. You know, he should be able to address this concern that we raise about um, you know, being bought over cheaply, selling your vote for next to nothing, and giving support blindly without really knowing how what you are doing is going to interest you, you know, yeah. playing wholly on ethnic and religious sentiments. 
you know. So those are those are things that I think a number of us will have learned in primary and secondary schools, but which we didn't. Well, so now coming back to home the country. Mm, mm, mm. Now, how do you address that? Well, I I, I think I think uh, we need to add some very important uh, subjects in our curriculum. For me, I, I think, for example, that history is a must. Yes. It's a must mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that every student, with you. every student who goes primary, secondary school must do history to the last day of school. Yep. Everybody. Mm -hmm. What do you think about adding a subject on logic? Oh, I'm, com I'm coming to it. See, logic, philosophy, basic. Logic. Yeah. Okay. See, I was lucky. My father was a historian and he loves philosophy. See, in my house, I, I used to, when I was about 10, 11, mm -hmm. we used to play what we called, uh, I don't know, is it a... Uh, Socrates parlor game with my, with my dad, but we used to play that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a logic, it's a logic uh, uh, yeah. problem. Yeah, I used to play that with my dad. Now, every I was lucky, everybody do, do not have that. But the school, the school's the curricular, I will tell you, I know you, you love the cosmos, yes, yeah. see. See, was, I, I, I will tell I, you. I can't, I can't overemphasize the impact oh, that. Me, me too. Yes. Me too. See, Carl Sagan mm -hmm. did a wonderful job on you and me. Yeah, sure. Okay. If I can have two of his books. I, if I if I if I take myself back to those days mm -hmm. and uh, what I had in mind, I will have said, oh. Maybe I will have become an astronaut or something. Okay. <laughs> With the exploration of science and space. So interesting. Yeah, interesting. You know, you want to you want to be part of that. Yeah. Right. See, so so those, so those are the things that influenced me and you. We need more of those things in our education system. Exactly. We need we need this, we need a way of um, gamifying certain subjects like logic, like uh, history, you know, because children love... History, logic, yes. uh, uh, civil, civil, uh, civil uh, yeah, uh, knowledge. What is knowledge, yeah. okay? Those exactly. should be, a, a, they, should, they should be compulsory for everyone. Yes. And they, they need to, we need to create a way of making it, or, you know, imparting knowledge through some kind of gaming system. A game where children will find fun. You know, you don't want to make it too serious. Of course, yeah. a lot of a lot of children will just find well, it boring. See, like this is this is the, this is the job of educators. Yes, see? and yes. there are so many ways to teach these things mm -hmm. so that it it's not boring. In fact, it will be exciting for yes. young people to do. Yes, yes. they will be, they will be playing. What? Under 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 the, the radar, they're mm -hmm. learning basic and very important lesson about life. Yes, about their society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, and uh, th this thing about uh, I heard the the, the stop uh, history for for some years. See, mm -hmm. it's the most idiotic decision. <laughs> yeah, it was see, purely driven by politics. See. It was pure political considerations. When you when you stop teaching history, yes. For what reason? What are you what are you trying to get by doing that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I thought about it and I felt maybe some of the people who felt they committed a couple of atrocities in the past and are still alive don't want their names mentioned negatively in historical books. You know, especially uh, given you know some of the some of the uh, propaganda mm. that pushed out in the past, 
And of course, if you take a look at our, our history as a country, you know, a number of the ethnic groups we have in Nigeria today were loggerheads uh, like 100 years ago. Yeah. That's history. I, I don't see anything wrong with teaching that history. Teach it. I don't see anything wrong with teaching that history. See, when, when you teach it, said, when you teach it, yes. the, the current generation will say, oh, so that's where we were. Oh, where we, we were. Where we were. We were, now, we were so close to then. Now, is it, you know, we're yeah. better now. Exactly. But a lot of people will learn from the past and say, hey, you do this, this is what you get. So our, our ancestors were doing it, and this is where it led them. You know, it, it didn't work out well for them. Yeah. We shouldn't be embarking on the same path. So those are, they just are supposed to be the positive lessons we take from history. But like you said, now that they've stopped teaching history in schools, I don't know whether they will bring it back, right? No, I, how, I, thought, how will, I thought we were bringing it, bringing it back. I, I don't know. I don't know. How, you, how, you, will, you how will people know history? Even the, even the history that we learned in school then was just so pedestrian. There was yeah. nothing deep about well, it. Well, for those that, that actually did uh, O-level history, they, they learned more. You know, we, we stopped doing history from after from, from three. Because it, it wasn't interesting. We didn't yeah. find it interesting. That's well, why we well, stopped. It, well, it was. It was. I, I, I would have continued. History is one of the best, best subjects today. <laughs> to, today, eh, I yes. read history more than everything else. Everything, actually, history at the end of the day. Yeah? The entire body of human knowledge is history. history. You know? so, <laughs> yeah. So I find it so interesting. Well, to I'm, I'm right, right now, I'm reading this, uh, this, uh, The Ascent of Money by oh, Neil F Ferguson. Oh, I just started wow. re reading it uh, about uh, two days yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. I'll look into that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very, yeah. very interesting. Mm. It's very interesting. You know. So, see, uh, education is, is number one. Absolutely. If, if, one of the Nigeria and Africa wants to to develop. Develop is human capital. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the only way we can develop our human capital. It's actually what is drawing us back, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so that's that's the key thing drawing us back. Mm, mm. So our new president. Ashwaju Bola Yes. Yeah. Ashwaju Bola Tinubu. So tell me. Your immediate views about uh, about him, his decisions, uh, the first subsidy wahala, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 cabinet. I heard one of I saw on in the news one of the ministers, uh, the ministry they were they were they were protesting this morning or was it yesterday? Okay. That he locked the he locked a lot of them out because they came to work late. <laughs> oh, yeah, bad, 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 you know, you know, people out. Okay, fine. I'm more impressed in the kind of policies you have. Yes. And how you want to carry out those policies. It's okay yeah. to lock latecomers out. Mm. You know, and uh, you know, but that's not the only way, that's not the only thing to do. Yeah. There are plenty of things to do. So I'm more interested in what plans you have mm. and what kind of results should you be expecting. Now, coming back to the questions you asked. So um, the president has been in office for four or five months, right? Yeah, about that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's taking some very bold decisions. Yeah. The first one was the removal of the first Yeah, which, right? I, which I support. I support. And for me, it's inevitable. No, so I always, I always say this. I know I had a couple of, I can, you know, I've been engaging a number of discussions on with a number of people, and um, I think people, people are not looking at this from the big picture. You see, in life, it was just like they made this, uh, that very popular statement that um, there are two ways of helping people. Mm. You can either give them fish. Or you, or you teach them how to fish, right? Yeah. So for me, subsidies like that, right? So you can have your subsidies or your fish in many ways. You can take it 
and eat it. Or you can take it and learn how to you know, multiply it. Multiply it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Now, it's so easy to say, oh, give us subsidies, you know. When you take subsidies and you consume, you, it goes into consumption, right? It's like you're eating your future now. Yeah. It makes you dependent on that subsidy, on that system, right? Yeah. But when you take the same resources and you invest in capital goods that will produce more, more. Goods, yeah, right? you are basically uh, you are multiplying it. Yeah, multiplying it and fortifying your future and basically creating more prosperity for yourself. So there are many ways of. I mean, for me, life is all about subsidies. Let's face it. When we were born, we we, we could not do anything. So our mm. parents practically subsidizing us. Yeah. All through primary, secondary, and university. Uh, even after university, your parents, your parents are still subsidizing some people. But the question is, can that kind of subsidy continue forever? Yeah. So can do we want subsidies that will make us dependent or do we want yeah. us independent? Right? So I think the way subsidies have been structured in Nigeria have always made us dependent. And when you when you subsidize consumption that way, you don't have enough left for investment into infrastructure, capital goods. Those because yeah. they are also for some kind of subsidy. Of like course. Now I'm seated here. Let me assume between here and my house, there are no roads. Yeah. I have to but I want that money given to me uh, to go and buy something for me to eat. Mm. I mean, there's, of course, the option of all of us pulling resources together and building roads for ourselves, which is essentially subsidizing transport. We could, like, like, we, all of us can walk. We can say, okay, you know what, I want to walk. I want to walk home. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, wait for uh, somebody to come and spend the money smartly. Let, let me just take the money, use it to buy food now, and I'll be walking home every day. But if that money is put into infrastructure, then I become more productive. Yeah. I get faster. I can do more. You know, more goods can move on that road and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, subsidy removal, subsidy itself is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to invest in the petroleum sector. Yeah. In, absolutely impossible. Because why would anybody want to build refinery when, when petrol is being sold below the price? In the country, yeah, that's what that's what this is what a number of people didn't understand or still don't understand. What drives the price of petrol in Nigeria is the international price of oil. Those components, the other components about transport, shipping, blood, blood storage, they're actually small elements. The big element is how much it costs in the international market. How much the price of crude in the international market? So the more the higher this thing goes up, the more expensive it becomes. Now, people have made the argument, oh, we are an oil producing country. We should be getting benefits. The problem is, I don't think Nigeria should actually be called an oil producing country. Because if you compare the numbers with yeah. other countries, Nigeria is 210 million. We're producing at about the same level as Libya, maybe actually slightly lower than Libya. Libya, I don't think they have over 10 million people in Libya. And people. No. no. Yeah. And people expect the per capita income on crude oil to be as high to as. To be the same. Possible. Yeah. Not possible. You know? So basically, what we've done by uh, this demand for subsidy left, right, and center, we've just made it possible for some demagogue and corrupt bureaucrats to take the little that we have and basically dece deceive us about uh, using it to help us. Yeah. While incapacitating us. Yeah. Making us a lot less productive than we should have been. You know? Yeah. Because really what we need as people are, is the infrastructure to make us productive. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have Now, you want to export something out of the country, the port is in shambles, the roads are in shambles, there's no real infrastructure, you know. 
you can't travel between here and uh, some states without getting kidnapped, right? All of these things for me are connected. Oh yeah, they, they are. All they connected. are. Yeah, you know. So, but of course, you can also look at it from the other side, which is what's the argument that those that are clamoring for subsidy? What's the argument they're making? Some of them are saying, "Oh, you know what? It's an irresponsible government that we've always had. If you don't spend the money." directly on you, they are going to steal it. There's a case to be made there, right? But it's almost like saying, I'm trying to find a good analogy now, and I think I'm struggling. It's almost like saying, oh, because somebody is going to steal your food. Yeah. The food you have in your... Just eat all, eat all of it now. Mm -hmm. it off today. Forget yeah. about tomorrow. <laughs> You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't don't reinvest. That's the argument they're making. So I don't think it's right. Now, the other key trust of this administration is mm. the appointments, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. a certain rumor that is forex, which I will also want to talk about. Yeah. There, there is uh, the kind of appointments the government has made, you know. I think um, the appointments have been quite diverse, and a lot of the people appointed are actually quite experienced. You mentioned mm. one that is already locking out people for coming. <laughs> the the uh, only uh, one I, I actually know a little bit about is the new CBN governor. Uh, okay. He, he, he was the chairman of uh, SIT Group. So me, I yeah. know I haven't worked since, so I I know a little bit. I still follow what what they do, but Fantastic. yeah, uh, yeah, but oh, uh, so, yeah, go on. So I mean, that's a very seasoned personnel. So these are not these are not people who don't have pedigrees. You know, they are they have a whole lot of pedigrees and experience mm. that I think that I think will help the country. But mm. for me. You know, appointing the right people is just one element. One it. element, yeah. You have to empower them, right? Hold them to account to results. And uh, you need to also support them. You see, a lot of the issues we have are not just issues of not knowing what to do. It's really about having the political will to take some of these tough decisions. Yeah. You know, and I think President Tinumbu showed that he has that will. The removal of subsidy and some of the steps he took on Forex. Now, okay. talking about Forex, I actually don't think they managed that one well. You know, I think they left too many things to um, chance. Okay. And I think that's why the Naira has uh, lost a large chunk of his value, mm. you know. But what I'm impressed about is how they are quickly reacting. So okay. they're, not, they're not just sitting down and doing nothing, you know. And and I'm sure that's why that's why the president appointed the new CBN government, you know, because I'm mean, sure he must have looked around and asked himself, this is a very tough job. Who can do it? Mm. Who understands this? Has the courage to take the right decisions? And can probably also work with people across so many agencies and across so many divides. Yeah. So it's still a new, relatively new government. Yeah, it is. Four or five months. But overall, I'll say I'm happy with what I'm seeing. Okay. I'm happy with what I'm seeing. I okay. think we're on the right path. I think um, if we are... You know, I've I've always been an advocate of a, a free free market economics with a tinge of welfareism, taking care of the people or the people that are left behind. Now, I mean, not not subsidy. I'm always for targeted subsidies. I'm not for blanket. Everybody, everybody eats. <laughs> My own is, you know, you target it at specific groups for a mm. period. Mm. Not in support of just giving out subsidies anyhow, like you know, like we've been having in the past, where even the central bank was was subsidizing 
programs. I mean, it's so ridiculous. We will hear the central bank. The detail of the central bank is monetary policies. Policy, yeah. Right, but I mean, these guys are you are engaging in programs like you are, you know, your regular government agency. You know, you hear the CBN is giving money to that group and giving money to this group, and you know, those those kind of things. Those are normally for, for what? For what? Who's money? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and if there's no money to be given, they go into their oh money and they create inflation. You know, so I think a lot of things were done wrongly in the past, especially the last eight years mm. of the US administration. Mm. Plenty of things were done poorly. Mm. The focus of that administration was not about developing our capacity. It was more, in fact, I'm to summarize this, I would say it was more about constricting our capacity to produce. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that's why we are finding ourselves where we are today. Yeah. Where well, foreign reserve has been totally depleted. Well, uh, I, see, I, I, I would say, say, we all, all the governments of Nigeria, very few, very few of them have uh, done anything to increase the country's capacity to produce yes. very yes. few absolutely uh you know why that is so because political considerations always take top priority yeah and that's why it's a very complicated country let's face it it's a very complicated country to run because there are so many conflicting interests all over right during President Jonathan's uh, regime, uh, government, you know, there were a number of laudable projects or programs on the surface. Power privatization was a good one. Yeah. You know, on the surface, it looked like the right thing to do. Mm. But then see how it got hijacked. See how it got hijacked. And I'm yeah. sure the reason Vest, why vested was, interests. Yes. Vested Everywhere. Interest, political consideration. That's how that's that's how a number of programs end up in Nigeria, right? It's always the best interest. No, see, it's not only in Nigeria; it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Well, the everywhere. the the only thing is that in Nigeria, in Africa, we don't have the in, in, institutions to fight yes, it. Maybe. Yes, and of course, even the people. Because the people are divided along religious and ethnic ethnic lines, they yeah. cannot present a united front against this and, interest. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that's why these interests that's why they have their way so easily. And and that's why they would see they will they will make sure that the the younger generation are not educated properly mm -hmm. to. Start, stand back and say, no, you can't do this because yes. this is not much to my interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see? So, see, ah, oh, man. It's a very complicated the, country. The, this, 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 these new ministers, mm -hmm. they have uh, their work cut out. Plenty. Yeah. Because, Plenty. see, ministers cannot do anything. Mm -hmm. Ministers can set policy guideline okay but uh unfortunately he can enforce though I yeah mean, okay I... yeah he, he 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 can but then he still need some people mm, yes mm -hmm. in the ministry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my pro my problem is this what percentage of the people who work in the ministry in a, in a mini ministries have uh, have done their jobs in the last 10 years? Very low. Okay. <laughs> See, th this is the issue. A very yeah. straightforward answer. <laughs> this is the issue. Yes. See, it's as if majority of our population who work for the government on the, on the basis that the government doesn't pay very well. They have Just, not been doing their. They, they have not been doing doing their job. Very, it's a very weak excuse. The government no, is not oh, doing their job. That's, that's what they say. And okay. Find to do. Okay. See, 
say for me, if the government is not paying it very well, cool. Write your letter of resignation, mm -hmm. hand it in, and go. Mm -hmm. But if, even if the government is not paying it very well, you want to remain, please mm -hmm. do the job. Come yeah. to work. Come to work on time. Yes. Do the job you are supposed you are supposed to do, yes. and leave on time. Yes. Yes. So we have a large population of our employees under the government who do not do anything. Yeah. And uh, I won't be surprised that uh, a large population proportion of them are ghost workers <laughs> eh? just have, having their name on the on the on the payroll eh? you see I'm, I'm not really worried about those people i'm more worried about the people who are responsible for those agencies okay so i mean for me it's pretty much like you know what we do here we have responsibilities to our clients okay partners and all that yes and if we're not delivering, we simply lose it. We lose it. Oh, that's that's people are that's pri private business. That's what, yes. what happens. Now, that's now, I, I totally agree. It's not exactly. It doesn't translate the same way. But you know, there are a lot of similarities, right? And you know, in our own case, the people we are accountable to are actually our customers. Yes. Right. But in the case of the government, who are they accountable to? That's really the problem. Okay. They're See, supposed to be accountable to the people of the country. Okay. We should have the power, power to sack them, just they like can't. our clients have the power to sack us. But they can't because there's, there's no direct, how do I put it? There's no direct linkage between what they do and the people they're supposed to be accountable to. Even when, even when they are, they are a, a, a particular role interacts with, with the public, yes. okay? If you come to the to the ministry to get set, certain thing, either a form or whatever, mm -hmm. and the, the person who is supposed to give it to you mm -hmm. is on on five hour lunch. Yes. <laughs> How about they hold this lunch? Yeah, so <laughs> you, you can't do anything. See, yes. I've heard of people come to to a ministry to get something done mm -hmm. that do come to the, the ministry every day for weeks mm -hmm. and can't do anything. Yes. Can't see the person they're supposed to see. Yes. And nobody nobody cares. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a huge drawback on the country. And for me, the problem actually goes deeper than what we're just saying. Because for me, it connects back to the political structure of the country. Mm. Right? So when you see an agency that is not accountable to the people. Yeah. We know there's some dysfunctionality there because ordinarily, like you know, like we have in the private sector. Mm. If I don't deliver a good job, my customers yeah, I, will, I won't pay you. <laughs> I, will, I will not pay you. <laughs> now, if, uh, if I'm not delivering a good job and you continue to pay me, then well, that means that, that's my fault. How, that means how they go to your head. That's what it means. <laughs> or I'm holding you hostage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what is happening in this case too, right? So yeah. if those people are not accountable to those that they're supposed to be serving, yeah, definitely means that they are just holding them hostage. Yeah, they're holding them to ransom. That's what it is. Okay, now, now let, 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 let me let me let me take it back one way. Mm -hmm. Say this is the this is the, I will say this. This is actually the issue. For decades, the biggest employer in a nation, government, mm -hmm. hired staff, give away contracts, do everything not on merit. That's it. That's, I was the, that, it. that's it. That's it. I, I was going to point. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is it. That's it. Now, and my, my point is, it's not so straightforward. Okay. Because you know, like like you know, the private business and its client, for example, I mean that's a very straightforward thing. 
You don't do the job, you don't get paid. Simple. Yeah. Right? You lose business. And that motivates you to either work harder or to find something else to do. Yeah. Right? In the public sector, that relationship is not like that. Mm. And that comes down to the kind of political system that we run. Yeah. You know, our political system makes it almost impossible for the people in charge of our affairs to be accountable to the people that they're supposed to be representing. And that's the fundamental problem that we are, that we are talking about here. It's a fundamental issue. I mean, a lot of countries have that same issue. I mean, practically, yeah. practically all countries have it to some degree. Yeah. But what you realize is the more democratic a country is, the more accountable the representative are to the people, right? And what makes representative not accountable to the people? Part of it is, is you know, the makeup, you know, of the society. The yeah. more divided people are, of course, the more difficult it will be for them to unite against the ruling class. They are oppressor. <laughs> I was trying to from that Let's just say the ruling class. That, that, that word is so... It's so it's popular now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So now we have a country that's divided on so many fronts. Yeah. So how are we going to ever be able to hold people accountable when we are so divided? For me, that's the fundamental thing. So if you can address that problem of division, so and I'm not saying we address it by getting everybody to marry the wife from other ethnic groups. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you call them? People with uh, ancestry from different parts of the country. No. Yes. That that problem needs to be addressed in a manner that you know what I call polit politically coercive units, mm. right? You know, people that have common interests, common. I don't want to use common identity, you know, because I mean that's that's taking it too extreme in my own in my opinion, but some kind of common interest, because it's really common interest that brings people together at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? If there is no common interest, there is no, there is no reason why people should work together. Right? And at the end of the day, progressive societies are where a large chunk of the people have agreed to work together in a manner that benefits everyone. Region. Yeah. So, so that thing is, that thing has to be baked into our, into our political system, well, into our constitution. See, I think it's the biggest challenge that we that we are facing. Mm, mm. See, for example, citizenship is based on ancestry. Yes, a tribal country. Okay. See, for me, for me, see, if Nigeria, being so diverse, mm -hmm. if we actually want to move forward in a progressive manner citizenship should not be based on ancestry mm -hmm. but based on where the individual is born one mm -hmm. or two where the individual has lived for a certain number of years but number mm -hmm. one should be where the individual is born or really? maybe Maybe sec secondary should be okay, your ancestry. So I may be my my parents may be from Delta, but mm -hmm. I was born in Kano. Mm -hmm. So my parents can be from Delta, okay, mm -hmm. but me, I'm from Kano. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if somebody like me, a Kene from Kano. And maybe uh, Suleiman, whose parents are from Sokoto, but mm -hmm. Suleiman was born in Ebony. Suleiman mm -hmm. is from Ebony. Yes. Right? So if things like this happen, so that your name doesn't actually identify your state of origin. Mm -hmm. If this is common across the country, See, it will be very difficult for anyone to just hear your name and say you are this. Yes. Question is, how do we make that happen? Okay. Well, be because this thing you said, 
you know, um, circles back to this merit meritocracy, yeah, dysfunctional political system issue. So how do we make it happen, right? It can implement a lot of policies. Education, you know, we were education already, university. I mean, that's like the bedrock. That's the foundation, right? But education will take you fifteen to twenty years before you start getting. Well, see, this this is a is a is a long term project. Yes. Okay. I mean, if our father started it in nineteen sixty, I'm sure. Okay. By now, it's, it's right. by now, by now, it would have been it it would have, it would have been everywhere. Okay. Back. <laughs> yes. So, but. I'm not even sure there's a consensus across the country now that, hey, you know what? This is the kind of education that we want or that we should have. And um, this thing about where you are born or where you've lived the most of your life being a better identifier yeah. than your ancestry, you know? So, so how do you- I, I, I will tell you, eh? yes, I speak Igbo, or I used to. I was born in Delta, mm -hmm. but, I'm more Yoruba than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, more, see, Le Le yeah, Yoruba, eh? I'll tell you today, eh? 90% mm -hmm. of my friends are Yorubas. 90% mm -hmm. of my friends. That's where, that's where you grew up. You grew up in yeah, Lagos. Where yes. I grew up. Yes, respected. Right. So your identity should be Lagos. It's Lagos. My my yes. identity, okay? That's now, you can see states, I can still claim my or my 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 uh state of origin as delta because i was born there mm -hmm. so that's that's but but i believe i, mean, I even think because, you know, claiming oh, the state of origin is right? state of origin means what at the end of the day okay the state where your parents came from or where you are born okay but it has very little bearing on the kind of individual you have become yeah it's exactly your, your life I, i've lived that. all my life in like i live before i came to the UK, I lived all my life in Lagos. Yeah, exactly. If you didn't tell anybody, if you're working on the street of Lagos, I'm talking, nobody w without will... My, without anybody knowing my name. Your name. You, yeah. so everybody will just assume you are you are one of us. You get what I'm saying? So I'm one of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. yeah. So, but my point is, so how do we make that happen? You know, because uh, in, in a large track of the country, you know, there's ancestry thing is still so strong and this is these are the, these are the points where we are divided yeah. which means you see for the political merchants to take advantage of um, the people you know because without that unity how do you how do you put up a united front mm. right so it's a big challenge and i know it's not just in nigeria though it's it's global it's global yeah. The more tribal a society is, no, I mean, it, it, it's actually. It, I don't know. I don't know if it's global anymore. Okay, okay. I know in Tanzania they don't do anything about uh, Tanzania. They everybody is Tanzania. Let me give you an example. Take, take South Africa for example. I mean, okay. this is xenophobia thing. That's yeah. actually this is my opinion. Mm. It's it's for just a mild form of. Identity politics, which yeah. you can extend all the way to tribalism and racism, yeah. mm -hmm. stuff like that. Oh, it's not it's not from here, but it's been contributing to the progress of this place. You know, should you not be more interested in what, how much benefit this individual has brought to your environment than yeah. where he's from? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why I said it's a global thing, but it tends to be stronger where the education level is very low. Mm. The lower the education level, the stronger the identity politics that you have. Yeah, okay. Right. You know, where the education level is higher, it tends to be, even if it's there, it tends to be a lot more hidden. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it's, it's just a spectrum, it's a progression. From xenophobia to tribalism to racism, for me, it's all part of identity politics. Yeah, yeah. So, but in the case of Nigeria itself, how do you solve this problem? Because it's actually one of the things holding the country back. Yeah. Without solving that problem, we are not going to attain the right level of meritocracy 
that we need to move ourselves forward. No. But no, that, that's that's why I'm bringing it bringing it up because until we see, until we stop identifying ourselves based on on ancestral heritage yes. and name, the yes. language. No, see, we cannot we cannot fully move forward. You can. It's, it's hard. Okay. I'll give you an example. So, in my business, there's nothing like family member or anything. You know, it's all about. Oga, what can you deliver for this business? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So, there's no nepotism. There's no mm. tribalism. There's no. If you set up your business and you do tribalism, yes, now you're you gonna lose. <laughs> you're gonna carry, you carry your course. It's so straightforward. Yeah, you know, and you don't look at it when you are when you are dealing with a client, when you are proposing uh, your service to someone, because at the end of the day, you want to deliver a good service and be successful. Yeah, but but when it comes to government. Business, yeah, yeah, it depends everything. Yes, I understand this thing about protecting interests. You know, you don't want some people to be left behind because there's a lot of inequality in the country, some people need to be protected. But is that the best way to do it? They're riding on the sentiment of the majority, yeah, to protect the interests of a minority. That's it. I, the, moment we, the moment we understand the game, then we know what's up, but most of us don't. We don't know that. Oh, at the end of the day. Those of you that have been propagandized into believing some of these things, you are not benefiting anything from it at all. But like you are the ones that is being used or being sold. Yeah. For the interest or benefits of a few. The few do not benefit. They don't. Because for the few to benefit, they need to solve the problem that is holding them down. I'm talking when I say the few, I'm talking about you know the people pulling the strings. And I mean, okay. I don't, I don't, oh, okay. Oh, okay. I don't <laughs> want to name. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I, I I get you. Yeah. But um, you know, ex identity politics taken to extreme extent. Yeah. Right. And that is one of the things holding us back, making it difficult. It's a it's a big it's a big deal. Good people running a number of things in this country, mm. right? You know, we can talk about what to do, I mean, what solutions, education, right? A proper legal framework to, education is for me is fundamental. Yeah. You know, very fundamental, right? A proper legal framework to protect people. Yeah, to protect yeah. everybody. To protect everybody. Yeah. You know, strengthening our institutions, awareness and uh, sensitization, which is, you know, it's a form of education. Be -do. Be -do. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. if education, like we, talk, we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. 12 years of education for everyone and a um, proper okay. legal framework, mm -hmm. then that that will solve seventy percent of of the problem. I agree. I agree. Okay. I absolutely agree. That will solve seventy percent of the problem. How do we make it happen? Okay. <laughs> well, we we we'll talk about that. We we'll talk about that. Maybe maybe in a, in another in in another session. But I I want to talk to you about this. Yes. See, as a as a business person, mm -hmm. okay, what's your view about the incident migration of young Nigerians? Eh? Jackpa, eh? Wow. That's what. Yeah, wow. everybody, everybody, everybody wow. wants to go to Europe or, or Canada. Uh, eh? How 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 is how is this movement of talent affecting the country? I mean, it's a, it's a big it's a big issue, even in Europe. Okay, I'm going to talk to one of my very good friends. Okay, mm -hmm. he li he lives here. 
and we'll talk about this thing because it's affecting Europe badly because they're getting too, too many people coming in mm -hmm. and it's affecting Africa on the other side because very many talented people are living. You, you know, this thing, eh? I think it's most multifaceted and mm. it's um if we, if we want to really understand it fully, in my opinion, we need to look at all the uh, possible branches. For okay. one, Jackpa, okay, we can take it at two levels, the individual and then the society, mm. right? So for the individual, I've always said, okay, let's even go back in time. Let's go back to ancient times before we, have, we had countries. Yeah. When a location is not conducive for you, what do you do? Yeah, you move. You just pack your load and move to the next. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why you are, we are everywhere. Yeah. That's, that's how human beings colonize everywhere on the planet, right? Yeah. So this Japan thing is not something that's... Like no, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a human thing. <laughs> In fact, it's a human yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the same thing applies today. Yeah. If the place is too hot for you, or you... You move. You have a perception that it's too hot, and you have a perception that the next place is cool, then yeah, you move. Yeah. You know, I personally don't see anything wrong with that. No, no, no. Now, of course not. Now, this is the thing. So, for, for the individual, migrating can actually be beneficial. Yeah. Right? So, for one, you can get better education, careers, higher living standard, you know, growth, and that's on at, at the individual level. Then also consider that in, in Nigeria, for example, I think it's about 25 to 30 billion dollars that is remitted back into the country annually. Mm. Right. Mm. Maybe that money will not, maybe I'm just using the word maybe here, will not have come if those people had not emigrated to places where they could get those jobs and then use the remittance to help some of the people back home. Yeah, the is back home pays for a number of things. Right? Yes, and question is why? Why are people moving from this place to that place or to other places? It's largely because the environment has been made um, unconducive, unconducive for them. For, them. Exactly. Yeah. for the for young people, right? So if you make the environment unconducive, there will be a massive exodus of people. It's natural. I mean, human beings have been doing it. Since the first human being stepped on, on yeah. the earth. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't think anything is wrong with that. Now the, the flip side of this is when you have the most energetic segment of your country, yeah, side wanting to leave, you know, then there may be a problem. Brain drain, right? Yeah. And um, you know, there's an imagine conversation now about you know, this demographic shift and um, uh, declining birth rates in some countries yeah. and very high birth rates in some countries and how, uh, you know, people, let's take Nigeria, for example, you know, you school in Nigeria up to university level, it's part of your education was actually subsidized by the society, right? Yeah. Going back to the subsidy thing that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Part of your education was subsidized by the society. Now you take that education and the knowledge, then you spend, you emigrate abroad and spend some of the most productive time of your life working in a different environment, contributing to the social security scheme of that of those countries, right? Which is used to fund the Older, let me say, fund their social security. They yeah. have a position of pension. Yeah. Those that are sick, those that are living off welfare, and some of those things. So, and then when you get old, now I don't know about this, but when they get old, I think some of them are still qualified for the pension because they also contribute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they will. Yeah. Yes. But what you have just done is you have deprived your, your original, your of that uh, benefits, 
Mm. But I won't blame you if your your origin is not providing the avenue for you to contribute. Then it just makes sense for you to leave. Yeah, it makes perfect sense for you to leave and find somewhere else to go. And then I also want to say, you see, Jackpa. People tend to look at Jackpa from the perspective of uh, somebody leaving a country for another country. Jackpa can also be internal. Mm. Lagos, Lagos is, a, is a clear example of oh yeah this Jackpa thing where people Jackpa from all over the country and are moving into you know land in Lagos. Yes, ah! moving because they feel like hey, I can do better there, right? So, uh, so it's a mixed bag, right? For me, it's a mixed it's, it's a mixed bag. Now, how do we do? Number one, do we actually stand to gain anything by stemming that trend? I think so, you know, because the moment you start having professionals from your society emigrating, professionals that are supposed to be contributing, and entrepreneurs, your your doctors, your experienced doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, the moment they are leaving. I think long term is not good for the society. I, I think long term. Maybe yeah. in the short term, because they go, they earn some income and they start remitting money, you know, but you don't want to be caught in that cycle forever. You need and we have been we have been, we have been on it for, for for too long. That's why we are stuck. Yeah. <laughs> that's why that's why we are stuck. And, this... and part of the reasons again goes back to that thing about met, met, meritocracy. Meritocracy. Meritocracy, yes, exactly. Because look, if the society does not create the avenue for people to do well, they will leave. Right? So it's almost like a, a feedback loop. Mm. The opportunities are not there, people leave. And when people leave, those that are there lock the opportunities even more. And more people continue to leave. Yeah. You get. So we'll be stuck in this cycle for a very long time. And it's not looking like. I mean, I, rem I remember uh, Andrew. That's yes. a Andrew to check out. Yes. yes. I mean, that was in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we're still doing that, it. That, that trend is bigger than ever. You know, that trend is bigger than ever now. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. So. It's it's um so what do we do? How do we how do we stem this? How do we stem this? It's a it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, because like you said, see, uh, my migration is is natural. Okay, mm -hmm. people will all, always want to move when where they, wherever they are mm -hmm. is not con conducive for any reason. Okay, exactly. Okay, so see, for me. Uh, my my fear for Africa this century is that there is there is need to maintain to to to, to keep our most talented people home mm -hmm. because we need we actually need to build our our countries yes. it's very very important yes. and we need all these people. Mm -hmm. to be at least to contribute in some fashion to that development mm -hmm. yeah okay so yes. we need to 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 hold on to as many of them as possible so yes. i'm most concerned i'm most concerned when we lose start losing a large population of professionals mm -hmm. yeah okay i'm not i'm not too concerned when young people maybe just started out of uh, out of university leave to do to do a masters or whatever yeah but i'm most i'm most concerned about, about the professions absolutely. Okay? absolutely the young people we have we have in abundance yes okay but the professionals are your most experienced hands yes are leaving Ex experienced hands leaving is very very dangerous. Yes, it's a problem. So for me, it still comes back to some of the things we talked about earlier. Mm. Education is absolutely key. Yeah, especially in STEM education. Yeah, 
I mean, I think they are, they're prioritizing that all over the world. Very, very important. Yeah. We, we need this culture of entrepreneurship. I know mm. we say that means a lot, but we need to take it to the next level. It's not just subsistence and entrepreneurship like a number of people do. We need to take it to another level where we can become globally competitive. Yeah. As a, I don't think we are at the moment. We are not globally, globally competitive. No, at all. And I think, you know, we now have this opportunity to use digital infrastructure, broadband, some of the things that we are doing here to enable development all over the country. I think we have the capacity as a people. Okay. A number of businesses that are in this field, I think the capacity is there. Okay. You know. One thing that we don't do a lot in this country is we don't research. Oh, yeah. We consume a number of research products from elsewhere in the world, but we really invest in research. Yeah. And there's a lot of knowledge that is locked away in silos all over the place that can benefit the country if, you know, if we can find a way of having access to this and unleashing it to to help our development. Mm. You know, so fostering R and D is absolutely key also. Yeah. All right. Very, very important. Again, it, it goes back to that the quality of education that education. we have. Education. Education. 12 years, compulsory. Yeah. Uh, some of the things we said, putting in the right legal framework, uh, you know, teaching the right subjects and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. So I think then, of course, top on the list is we need the right leaders that are committed to making these things happen. Oh, yeah. Without, that, without the right leadership, we're just wasting our time. We're all going to be running like headless chicken all over the place. We need the right leadership at every stage, at every level. Yeah. One of, one of the things I learned in my first career was the importance of leadership. Right? You know, and... So I work for this company that but not now I think they're like 170, 180 years old. That's PNG. You know, so now yeah. you need to understand how a company can last so long. And it comes down to one thing. PNG emphasizes building leaders, developing leaders. Yeah. That's it. And they have they work it out to a science. You know, so by the time you work in the organization, P and G, G E. Leadership, yeah. So we need leadership at every level in this country. Yeah. All we have today are largely a number of people that are pretending to be leaders. <laughs> we also need the followers, right? Mm. We need followers who hold the leaders accountable. Yeah. Without working together, it's still going to come to, come down to the same thing. Yeah. Talking about man. We have work to do. Plenty. We have work to do. Yeah. But uh well, at least we know we know we have work to do. So let's yeah. let's 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 and it's a, let's it's a green field. It's a green field, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um the people that can that are that are skilled enough or courageous enough or lucky enough to do the work. <laughs> wow man Biodu, man, thank thank you very much for very much at least happy. spending this time with me you know to to thank to try much. to okay. talk about this this small small but big things <laughs> very interesting thing wow Oshigon, Oshigon. so much thanks yeah Oshie. yeah take care man take care and it gets to everybody yeah yeah same same uh, here same here yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Bye.